Not the first record, the second record, the third record, the fifth book, the ninth book. And then I think they know more about you than I do. Than I do. Than you do also. <laughs> so uh, these kids walk in the store and they put a tape on my machine. Do you recognize this? So I don't remember it. But it sounds like the kind of gibberish I was talking about with Bob Dylan. It sounds like PC. And uh, Bob Dylan is terrible. I asked him to sing. Uh, he answered my friend's blowing in the wind. And he goes, what, what, what? So he was uh, pretending. And, no, no, because I don't remember if that song even had a name at that time. Right? Well, I could, he sings it terrible. You can hear PC singer trying to do those uh, eclectic African sounds on top. And you can hear my bass voice at the bottom. And it's terrible. So I said, yeah. so where can we get this terrible tape? I have a tape in, uh, in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. The reason I forgot the program was, because what people don't remember now is, people will come to the store with tape recorders every day. I don't remember every time it's all day. There's no way. The program was so lousy, they never played it on BAI. You mean it technically? But the program was terrible. Garbage. What was you should be ashamed of yourself. You shouldn't even think of playing it on a radio program. Why? Because, of, because, of, because, of, because technically it was poor or they didn't like the song? No, it was a lousy program. I mean, everybody well, was lousy. You mean the performance was lousy or the, the technical? The performance was lousy. There was no togetherness. It was, it was an amateur. It was amateur. It was, well, amateur could be fun. Yeah, I know, but this was meant to be serious. It was meant to be serious, but it doesn't come off including me. Like, I'm trying to do the best I can the way I always do it on stage. But it didn't work. So, uh, we're going back to 1961, uh, and the problem with doing documentaries, they did a documentary on Bob Dylan now, they're doing it, and Pete Seeger was there and said, yeah, I knew he was great as soon as I saw him, and Allen Ginsberg would say, yeah, I knew he was great as soon as I saw him, and I said, why weren't they at his concert then? So anyway, I worked out a deal with, with Dylan, do a concert uptown. Now the concert uptown in the Carnegie Chapter Hall that cost me 125 bucks. So my store was free, and the Washington Square Church was like 25 dollars or 35. So a lot of people came to the store concert. Well, that, no, no, it wasn't. It was uptown. Oh, oh actually, you never had a store concert, did you? No, with Dylan. Though. Okay. So I said, Dylan, I can't give you half the gate because there's no way I can even break even. So we made an agreement that above my cost of $175 or something, uh, we would share the profits. So 53 people show up. Thule isn't there, Sanders is not there, uh, Alan Ginsberg is not there, Pete Seek is not there. All these people are saying, as soon as I saw him, they knew he was great. All, none of these people I never heard there. of that. Uh, you, didn't add, you didn't spend that thousand dollars on advertising. It was in the Village Voice, it was on WBAI. Yeah. It was on New York Times. It was Times. in the Village Voice with 300 other concerts, yeah. And I had a <laughs> newsletter which I printed up for 40 bucks, which I never did otherwise. Well, I maybe had I a Gestapo. Had, maybe I hadn't heard of them, but I Which I, I gave out to everybody. Everybody that walked into my store, yeah, I right. said, Tully, this guy is great, no, you gotta no, hear him. You didn't say that to me. When I had uh, just bought a record, <laughs> I heard Dylan for the first time at the community church uh, somewhere in the 40s. It was, it was a political benefit. What year? And I, when? Thought, I don't remember. But See? this little See? kid walks out with... Just a minute. This little kid... W w you and I were not the only people who uh, don't affect this way. This little kid walks out with that and he starts singing at the end or during the show. He was the only uh, entertainment uh, music there. And, you, and I said to myself, and the crowd did too. This kid is really something. This, uh, you know, this kid is really something. And this kid was really something. You know, <laughs> you could tell right away. It was no doubt about it. There was no. I don't remember ever. Uh, I don't think being very. You should have brought the program. Yeah. So, anyway. Okay. okay so I look let's forward. get that straight. Uh, I think Dylan was discovered first by someone named uh, Bob. Robert Zimmerman was discovered first by someone named Robert Zimmerman. So let's not be the dominant primate. Uh, this guy is pretty good. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't matter who found it out first. His mother probably found it. So it was great. Well, the great. thing is, Bob Dylan comes to my store. 
And it turns out that the first interview I did with a folky or folk thing was with Bob Dylan. And he starts telling me the story how he grows up in Duluth and how he's in California with Woody Guthrie and he thinks Jack Elliott was there. <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't doing anything at the time. And he was a minor son, right? And He's in Texas rolling around and he meets Mans Lipscomb. You know, you go in the cotton fields and you meet this old blues singer. And then he's walking around in Chicago and he meets this Arvelli Gray. Now we know that he borrowed 400 LPs on 78s from Tony Glover, blues freak from Minneapolis. And then he comes to my store. Gee, you know, I never saw anybody playing banjo until I walked into the store. I never saw a guitar before. And then he was playing with Bobby V in a club in Colorado. So at the age of 12, Bob Dylan was at the center of the folk music movement in America. And people ask me, how could you write this down in your notebook? I said, look, the first time somebody comes in, whatever they tell me, I accept. Until I start figuring out things. So uh, in 1962, Bob Dylan walks into my store. I said, Izzy, I got a song for you. I said, oh, come on, I'm busy now. So, uh, yeah, but you're going to like this song. So I said, you know, whatever I was busy at doing, you got to hear the song. So he gives me the manuscript of a song, Talking Folklore Center. And it was pinned up on a wall for a long time. So you still see 20 pin marks. It's a wonder nobody stole it. So somebody should have stole it. It's worth a lot of money now. So, uh, I said, gee, that's great, you know, you write a song about Hattie Carroll or Ned Grevers, or now you write a song about me, that's really nice. So I feel like a Jewish kid, working class kid from the Bronx, I can't just take the song from him. I gotta pay him something. Like, at the concert in Little Carnegie Hall, I lost money, really money. Well, for me, like $100 or something, that sounds a lot of money. But I gave Dylan $10 anyway. I said, Bob, you gotta take the $10. So I said, okay. He was very bad. So he comes and gives me this song, Talking Folklore Center. And I gotta give him a record. So I'm looking at the record. What record are I gonna give him? So what I particularly remember, I couldn't give him Judy Collins. I couldn't give him Odetta because I was selling them. So I had to give him something I couldn't sell, you understand? So I'm interested you in gave him my record. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him different than one of your records. Columbia Records put out a two LP set of Robert Johnson Blues. I bought three sets three years earlier. And guess how many sets I sold during that time? Zip. Zip. The horrible story is, now, it came out two years ago, it sold 600,000 copies in the United States. It's three CDs. Wow. So I couldn't sell it, Oscar. I tell people, you know, Bob Dylan's great, nobody gives a shit. I tell people, Robert Johnson's great, nobody buys it. So instead of giving him uh, Theo Bikel, or you know, which I could sell also, or, or the classic bar, I gave him Robert Johnson set. Because I couldn't sell it. It was a good move. A good move? Yeah. Because uh, now he was, then he was influenced by uh, Robert Johnson. Then, of course, he wrote the song. Every expert in Europe, when it comes to visit me for the first time in Stockholm, like I'm a living legend, unfortunately, but a better living legend than a dead legend. Uh, the first question they all ask me, Mr. Young, how do you feel about positively Kvorsky? So I said, what are you asking me for? I asked Dylan. And then I found I wrote something in one of my columns of sing out. Dylan comes to Greenwich Village. I break my ass for him. Dave Van Ryan breaks his ass for him. Bob Shelton, New York Times breaks his ass for him. Everybody's helping as much as they can. Everyone thinks he's great. And then I keep doing. Everyone thinks he's great. Everybody helps him. And then he makes it. And he leaves Greenwich Village, and he writes a song very bitterly, but you want to be in my shoes. Who so was that? Was that, uh, was that directed to a particular person? That's 
So. Well, a lot of people think it's directed to me. Some people think it's directed to Dave Van Rock. Some people think it's directed to Bob Shelf. You know, all the people that helped him. Right? It's like a story of uh, Strindberg. Strindberg works a play, wrote a play once, and he attacks a professor. Not really un unfairly, very harshly, very hard, and the name is almost the same as the professor's attacking. And they do an interview with the professor at the time, you know, 100 years ago, and they say, why does Strindberg attack you? He says, I don't know why, I never did him any favors, I never helped him, right? <laughs> yeah. What does he attack me for? I never helped him. No good deed goes in punishment. What's that? Where's the times? Okay. Nothing. The times they are changing. <laughs> yeah. Nothing good happened today. Oh, I didn't read the times today. You gotta tell me too, Sylvia, after you read it. Um, I don't know. Here, take, here's the second half. Sure. So what anyway, people kept coming to my store doing concerts, and the problem with my concerts were. When somebody did a concert for me, they had to break their ass for two and a half to three hours. They had to do a real concert, they had to think about what they're doing. I never told anybody ever what to sing or what to do. I never edited anything. I wasn't a producer in any sense. Somebody came in the store, sounded interesting, I just put them on. And then, like Ed McCurdy, he's furious at me because I did a concert with him in the store. I've taken a hundred dollars, he gets fifty dollars, and I get fifty dollars, and he's angry at me. He said, what are you angry at me for? You work for five dollars every Monday at Manny Roth's place. He was the MC for the concert today, where the author said, I'm not getting paid. Oh, but he's helping me. Yeah, but a lot, of, doing people, me a favor. A lot of people appreciated what you did for them, right, too, with them. A lot of people, everybody. Yeah. All right, so why don't you talk about them? Talk well, about the Bugs concert. Well, it wasn't even a concert. You, you played for free at my new opening in 1965. Well, that was a concert. When we played, that's a concert. That's a concert. I don't it remember that. that is, tell me about it. Ed Sanders remembers it. Ed Sanders remembers everything. He's got a photographic line. I opened the store in 1965 because I can't take McDougal Street anymore. Complaining about these coffee shops on McDougal Street not paying the singers. So I put a sign on my store in 1960 and I said, Johnny Mitchell, you know, and all these people that Ziegler, all these Arthur Lugans, they're not paying the singers any money. They were taking advantage of these youth groups. I go out for supper, my window is smashed. That's nothing. Today you have to, the kids have to pay to uh, You can attack anything you want to. You can say the communists are taking over Greenwich Village. You can say the capitalist pigs are taking over the Greenwich Village. You can say the mafia is taking over Greenwich Village. But you never name names. So that's been an important lesson for me, because every time you hear a politician talk about those crooks on Wall Street, you know, crooks at Beth Israel Hospital, then you know the guy's a crook himself. But unless you name names, you know, there's nothing you can deal with. Tell us about the uh, police riot in Washington Square Park. What year was that? 1961. They were singing Washington Square since about 1947. The folk singers. The folk singers. <coughs> and... For no money. Just playing. No money, just playing. And it was like a great scene. It was like the opposite of modern television. There's this pool, sort of waiting pool, and there'll be 10, 12, 15 groups around the edge. And then you would walk around the different groups instead of the groups moving around. You would walk around. Or there'd be solo players. There'll be solo players, uh, mostly group players singing yeah. Kumbaya or We Shall Overcome. Things like that, and uh, a lot of people later became well known and played it. Yeah, yeah Paul Clayton used to play there, Steve McHale played, played there, there. Yeah. Uh, Jack Elliott, uh, Woody Guthrie was there a couple yeah. times, uh, the Clancy Brothers were there all the time, Cynthia Gooding, uh, an old villagers, she was there. You would see everybody there. It was all free, it was a nice feeling, and in the old days, you had to be like an in-person to go to Margot Mayo's group or to Danny Goose or Pete Seeger. You know, it was like a hundred people that knew about it. And now suddenly, 
it was a place where anybody could go, and you never knew what you heard from one week to another. And I went there religiously. So I opened the store in 57, and there's some called Folk Singers Guild or something, having a license. Oh, you remember the Lionel Kilberg? Yeah. He had a group of shanty boys. And he had the license every year. And one day there's rumors that who is the guy on the male Aguadian that Pop used to love? The head of the park department. Oh, Moses? Yeah. Not Moses, no, after him. After Moses? Very beautiful, he used to have the carnation in his thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. After Moses was John? I think it was an Irish name. What's that? An Irishman, I think. He was really a great guy. We used to see him on Southern Boulevard all the time with uh, Bay LaGuardia. Morris? Yeah. Morris. What was his name? Is Morris. after Moses? Yeah. Moses lived? Morris. Yeah, Morris. New Bowl Morris? The guy's name was Morris. Yeah. I, there are rumors going around the village. New Bowl Morris. New yeah. Bowl Morris, okay. He was my family's hero. We would go to a meeting, remember? In the... Uh, in the we were all the movie houses. What's the street world of movie houses in the Bronx? And it was a meeting hall upstairs. And we would go there, and Newbold Morris would shake our hands. Oh, so, I think you're talking Washington Avenue, where they had the winter garden. Not Washington Avenue. Remember all the five movie houses were near Southern Boulevard? Well, Watson. Burnside Avenue, you had movie houses. Three no, not Avenue, that one. Yeah. Anyway, there's rumors around. They're going to kick the folk singers out of the park. There's rumors of complaints. What? Who were the complainants? Well, the Fifth Avenue Association. People who lived around? Maybe? People lived around the park. Wealthy people lived around the park. Like, well, we look at people differently. I yeah. like wealthy people. <laughs> so, yeah, but they don't like you. I know. You know. <laughs> so, so the wealthy, the wealthy exploiters of the poor innocent working class around Washington Square decided to get rid of folk music these anti trotskists these people were. And <laughs> there was a Greenwich Village Chamber of Commerce, and these rumors were really going around, flying around. And they were starting a campaign, all these liberal progressive coffee shops, they, they were having, like the kids come in, pay a buck to go into these places, and it would kick them out at 8 o'clock at night, and it would want more police protection. You remember when they were these people fighting for people's rights, wanted more police protection. We got to stop handling Greenwich Village, all these people. And then they would kick out the kids at 8 o'clock and then have the normal age tourists after 8 o'clock. So, listen, did you arrange that bus tour once to the suburbs? To Riverdale no, or something? Me. I think uh, Fred McDowell might have done that. It was a great thing, Oscar. They, they arranged a bus tour, because you know, all these people come from Riverside, to Riverdale, to the, to the village of Buses. So somebody, maybe it was Fred McDowell, yeah. hired a bus to take the villages out to Riverdale to see the people living out in the sticks there. So, oh, Lionel Kilberg comes to me and says he's not taking out the license this year. So I said, oh, okay, I guess I'll take it out. And Jack Philosophy is working for me then, Jack Ballard. The license to play in Washington Square. Huh. So, uh, that allowed everyone else to play too, right? So, <clears throat> I say, look, Jack, we'll take the license out. So whatever happens is we got to put the city out of it. So we apply for license. It's denied. We apply a second time. It's denied. And then me, Arthur, so this was the denied village by pay. the police department, right? Yeah, by not by the park department. All right. Oh, it's the park department. Yeah. yeah. All right. So but the police department come in to stop us. Oh, right. they enforce it. Right. right. They enforce it. Yeah, we were only here to enforce the law. You went to the park department and denied it. You went to the bar and denied it. So was New Ball Morris was not the park commissioner then? He was the park commissioner. Yeah. And it was Lindsay's administration? Then? Right. Yeah. No, or I'm pretty sure it was Moses. No, not Moses. No, 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 no. It, it wasn't Moses. Was the mayor. The mayor was... Was Grover Whalen. No, Grover Whalen no, was never mayor. No. Might have been Lindsay because... Who was the guy before Lindsay? Uh, it's before Lindsay. Procaccino? No. No. Uh, because Lindsay came into the store and he came to the place of the village. Dwyer? Is he what? Or Dwyer? Oh, Dwyer, oh, Dwyer. It was? Don't ask me, Izzy, what I can do for you, Izzy. What can you do for our administration? Something like that. So he learned all this. 
And so Lindsay, and he has a, an identical two, twin brother, more than Alan, used to dance there for three night parties. So, so, so the mayor was a Dwyer, we think. The mayor was a Dwyer, yeah. We're, we're not sure, though. And, uh... And New Gold Morris, the good guy with the park. The good no, guy with the park. That's all documented machine. on that film. Yeah, there's a film. What's the name? Where is it? Grace Sunday? Sunday by Danny Grace. D R A S I N, a very great film. You can never see it. We it's have wait, wait, so yeah. everyone says we can't sing, so uh, the church facing the square, what's that called? Church. Church. The Judson Church is supporting us. The Village Gate, Arthur Rudolph, my mother, John Mitchell. Clancy Brothers, Cynthia Cody. We were there, Sylvia and I were there. Was it not in the movie? How come it not in the movie? Oh, I don't know, because not everyone's in the movie. Our pictures no. in Life magazine. Yeah. yeah. We made the <laughs> Daily News to the river beatniks. Okay, so tell what, well, happened. So tell what happened. We go to the square, very orderly. This was our, this was our protest against. The protest. That is the organized, right? Not Mostly. totally long, but I was the, yeah. I was the main You were the leader. He was, I was the, the leader. He was our leader. Was your Fuhrer. And we started marching the square from McDougal Street. And Danny Drayson, who I knew vaguely, asked if he could film it. So I said, sure, why do I care? So he had one camera, a handheld camera, with a guy, you know the guy that did a lot of the filming. And we walk into the square, and the deputy police commissioner is standing there. The first kid. You're not allowed to sing it today. Oh no. You can't sing it today. There were hundreds of us. Yeah. And then one kid said, Where's Izzy? And that's my great moment in history when I become a leader. The first time I'm only here I am in my suit with a white shirt and tie. And the guy says, Mr. Young, yes. And he says, You applied for the park department and it was denied. You went the second time and it was denied. And we were only here to enforce the law. How many how many cops were there? Oh, hundred, about eighty, a hundred. Yeah. Now there were police also. Uh, uh, Patty wagons. You were there. No. Mama was there. I was in Florida then. And there were uh, cavalry police there on horses. Yeah. And so the guy says, "All right, you can go in the park, you can play, but you can't sing." <laughs> so the what? You can play, but you can't sing. So that's in the way. That was, so I said, oh, you know, the United States Constitution, freedom of press, freedom of speech. You can sing under your breath. Sing under your breath. Bad breath. Under your oh. bad breath. So the park, when you look at the film now, is squares built. Every kid has got short hair. Uh, they're all in suits like me. And I go into the middle, and I see the police all around. I say, oh, you They're going to knock the shit out of us. And you, are, you know how to watch Because in those days, you couldn't have a ride have. without police. Without yeah, police, there was no sort of like to beat the shit out of you, especially if you were young and uh, seemed to be So I say, oh shit, I stand on a little thing where the spray used to come out in the middle with a cover for it. And there's an NBC camera and a CBS camera, ABC camera. And I say to myself, I'm not getting away from this camera. As long as the camera's in front of me, I don't have to worry about the shit being beat out of me. And I look around, I can see police all around the square, but I don't see clearly, but I see God. I never saw so many police in Venice Village before. And I see the paddy wagon, and I see the cavalry officers. They cost the glass bed. So, so the, police, the vice, the deputy police commissioner comes to me and says, Mr. Young, can you please come on the side and talk to me? I'd like to talk to you about this. I said, no, 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 you're talking to me right here. Exactly. You're talking that's, to me right in front of What? That's on the film. What? Yeah. That's on the film. Yeah. And, uh, we talk right here. I'm not going to... Can you imagine me leaving, going on the side to talk to the police commissioner? Right. Yeah. So even I do. So they, I didn't want to do anything. So I had him sing uh, God Bless America, Star Spangled Banner. Did you stand in, your pants at all that day? What? Did you stand your pants at no. all? I was doing the righteous thing, just like I told the guy he had to let us give a chance to get the garbage on the dumb way to go. I think, who would think the dumb way would become a serious play later on, 40 years later? Yeah, well, they must have heard it back <laughs> So, uh, the demonstration is over as far as I'm concerned. We start walking out of the park. You said, you said all right, now we're going to leave and walk orderly, I think, to your place or to the church. 
I think it was to the church. Yeah. So, well, Sylvia is better than me. Yeah. Go. So Sylvia and I leave, or start, or we start to leave. And as we're starting to leave, everybody is leaving. That's when the cops said this is their last fucking chance to beat the kids up. As we're leaving, they start beating the shit out of everybody they can. And I didn't know that this was happening. Understand? Because we were walking toward the yeah, church. Yeah, you were pr you were ahead of everybody. I guess. Yeah, you were. So in other words, it was at the tail end where they yeah. start picking up all these kids. No, it wasn't even the tail end. It was just well, I think when you had reached the edge of the park. Okay, well there was still. A few hundred people. But I had no idea anything was happening. Yeah, no, because you were, this was, you were uh, 20 yards, of, uh, you were at the edge of the park, this was in the circle. So, uh, then it became an issue, it was in newspapers. People were hurt. People were hurt, and it's in the film also. And they went to the hospital, I don't know. So two know. people went to the hospital. Uh, French, is it Tom French? The guy ran a uh, black bookstore. It was interesting because his father was like uh, uh, one of the executives of Smith Klein of French. So these were like uh, 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 scum, you know, like the cop thinks of scum. He beat, a, he beat a black kid up and doesn't need to get away. Well, go on. Well, the thing is, we were lucky that day. Of course, there was no rainstorms, there was no birds of rainstorm coming in, there was no baseball games that day. People were arrested. Eichmann was executed the next day. You understand, Oscar? There was nothing happening that day. So we were all over the papers. Well, the Daily Mirror had a headline on the front page, 10,000 beatniks riding yeah, British I, village. I, I have that headline. Yeah. But that Times also had a... Oh, it had a big story. Right? Right? What? Six people arrested. I think six people were arrested. Uh -huh. And what happened to them? Oh, they were all were freed. So then we go to court. And we go to the first court. Somebody calls up the American Civil Liberties Union. They go down to Wall Street. There's this huge Wall Street office. You know, stamps from U.S. Steel and all these other companies. I'm, you know, my class hatred is coming up in my little heart here. And there's a big Wall Street lawyer on Wall Street in a fancy office taking care of my case. And he printed a deposition. So you were between you were summoned or what? Or arrested? I no one ever touched me. I, but I made a complaint. I see. Oh, and it's the only How time did you appear in court that. It was it's the only out. time that Israel Young is a plaintiff. I didn't even know what the word means. You know, I'm always wouldn't call the other guys when you arrested. Mm -hmm. What? Defendant. Defendant. I was always a defendant. This is the first time it says Israel G. Young plaintiff against the city of New York. <laughs> I still have that paper, you know. <laughs> and this guy had it printed in these professional law agencies it was printed on Monday, you know, there on Sunday. You know, it must have cost somebody $2,000 or something to get that printed beautifully like that. And we go to the first court, 